the shepherdess. Once upon a time, there lived a little girl named Mary, a fair child of aristocratic blood. Like all noble children, Mary was taught from home by a governess named Miranda. Miranda would teach Mary all that a lady needs to know about in the world, from sewing to mathematics to how to build a blade if needed, all of which the young maiden excelled in. Mary had everything she could ever need. She had jewellery of diamond, platinum, gold and silver in all forms, necklaces, rings, bracelets and her prized collection of silver bells. One from every known land. She had the finest cockle shells and conches from every known shore, gifts from her brother and sister-in-law. She even had the most beautiful maids to match her every whim. But contrary to the joy and pleasures she should be embracing, the maiden couldn't get past her loneliness. Even when walking through her mansion's large gardens of her maids, she felt isolated from the world. She may not have been a prisoner, but at only twelve she was certainly not allowed outside the walls of her home unaccompanied. Mary's father was a lord who doted on his only daughter. His son had married a princess. He needn't worry about the future of his estate or bloodline. Those were secure, which gave him plenty of time to focus on the apple of his eye, his sweet Mary. Often he would watch her studying the flowers she'd planted herself, and often he'd ask how her garden was growing. But still there was no joy in his daughter's heart. Everything she did, though beautiful and with grace, was monotonous. A lady should have friends, her father thought to himself, but I can't just invite random maidens to our home. They could exploit us for our wealth. Take advantage of my girl. I need to protect her. He had to think of a solution, and a solution he found, though an unconventional one. Mary was brought into the morning room with a ribbon of silk shrouding her eyes as her father told her to approach. A maid gently removed the blindfold to reveal her gift, a little lamb with a fleece as white as snow. Mary ran to him and held him close. The two bonded immediately, and it wasn't long before they were never seen apart. Everywhere that Mary went, her lamb followed. The little bell around his neck ringing with every step he took, chimed the lamb, named so after his bell, especially chosen from Mary's beloved collection, was treated as well as any noble, and was Mary's closest friend and confidant. When, Ma when word of an invasion came to the house, Mary's father wasted no time in sending her away to a distant village, where he was assured she'd be safe. Once there, Mary was disguised as a common peasant, in the hope she wouldn't be targeted by the invaders. She left just the clothes on her back and chime in her arms. The villagers found Mary to be a rather queer character. She didn't act like a villager. She didn't look like a villager despite wearing their clothes and her obsession with her little lamb was perplexing. To these villagers, farm animals were just that, farm animals that were there to serve a purpose. The cows give milk and meat, the chicken meat and eggs, horses were transported, pigs were food and foragers and the sheep were meat and wool. They liked animals, of course, but none had truly bonded with an animal in the same way Mary had. What perplexed them even more was when Chime followed Mary into the schoolhouse. She didn't notice him at first, but the other children did, and he caused a ruckus. Children were pointing and howling with laughter. The teacher had enough and kicked Chime out. Not wanting to abandon her oldest friend, Mary followed Chime out of the schoolhouse and in turn gave up on school altogether. The other children couldn't understand why a child had abandoned school for a little lamb and the teacher tried to explain that Mary loved the lamb so. The days passed with no word from her home or when she could return. So Mary and Chime wandered the streets of the village with little to no pity from the villagers. They could smell the aristocracy radiating from her being. That's not to say no one took pity on her, for there was a local farmer's boy, by name of Beau, who took a liking to Mary and asked his mother if she could come home with them. The mother hesitated on her decision until one rainy day when she was out gathering supplies and saw a downtrodden Mary and Trime trying to take shelter on the doorstep of a local bakery. Mary was brought to the farm and put to work tending to sheep, a job neither she nor Chime minded. She took a liking to one particular sheep, with wool as black as coal. Mary had never seen a black sheep before, 
having only spent time with Chime up to this point, and she fell in love at first sight. The custom on the farm, and indeed many others of its sort, was to not name the animals, as that would mean you'd have former connection with them, but Mary pleaded to get to name this little black sheep, and, knowing the villagers had little need for his particular wool, the farmer allowed it. Mary named his sheep Bartholomew, or Barbar, as she affectionately referred to him, and he would become just as close a companion as Chime. As the months dragged on, Mary began to accept the likelihood of returning to her old life was becoming slimmer and slimmer, as she found comfort in her new family, the Peeps. Mary became particularly close to Beau, who she referred to as Little Beau, due to his short stature. The pair grew to think of each other as siblings, with Beau reminding Mary of her older brother, who she also hadn't heard word from, due to how occupied his schedule was now he was a prince. On one occasion, Beau made the mistake of forgetting to close the gate of the sheep pen, and a flock went missing in the local woods. Knowing the severity of the situation and remembering the tale of how his great uncle's own flock was slaughtered by the big bad wolf shortly before the previous inhabitants of the village were also killed, he feared for the worse. Mary, who had become something of a sheep whisperer, assured him that if they give the flock the space to roam around and explore, they'll eventually grow bored and drag their tails back home. As the night gave way to day with no sign of them, Mary took it upon herself to explore the woods accompanied by Chime, Barbara and Bo, who brought a shepherd's crook for self-defence. The woods were cold and dark and the pair had little hope they'd find their flock in one piece. For hours they searched with no sign until out of the brush came the wolf with eyes redder than rubies and fur almost as dark as the night. It's not often my meals comes willingly to me. The wolf licked his lips as it crept closer to the children. Back away, wolf. Bo pointed his crook at the beast ready to strike a blow. The wolf circled around the group, sniffing the air and eyeing up Chime. I smell his blood on you, boy. The wolf directed his statement to Bo. The great peep dynasty continues with you. I killed your great uncle, and I will kill your cousins too when I find them. But at this moment, I shall settle for your blood. The wolf pounced towards Bo, who slipped backwards and fell to the ground with a thud. Baba ran out in front of the wolf and stared him down. The wolf swiped at him, but even injured, he refused to back down. The sheep looked the wolf dead in the eyes, as if telling him to sting his hook, and impressed by his feat of bravery, the wolf did indeed back down and headed deeper into the woods. Despite having shaken off the wolf, the group still had the task of finding their sheep on their hands. Their feet carried them deeper into the woods where all manner of beasts roamed the night, but they eventually found their missing flock taking shelter in a cave half a mile north of the farm. The group returned home, and once the sheep were secured in their pen, some villagers arrived at the farm. A local hunter had spotted the children in the woods and followed them. He told his fellow villagers of Barbar's bravery, and everyone wanted a piece of his lucky wool. They sold it to everyone who was anyone to the masters and the dames from near and far, and to the poor children they gave the wolf for free hoping it would bring them good luck, inspired by the plight of a little boy who lived down the lane. The peeps found themselves wealthy selling the wool of the sheep from the now legendary story, and their old farmhouse soon became a mansion. When they were old enough, Mary and Beau were married, to cement Mary as a worthy member of the peep dynasty. Both wore dresses embroidered by the finest seamstress in the kingdom. Beau had taken to wearing dresses after conflicting accounts of the story had mixed he and Mary into one character, the figure of little Bo Peep, and with their wedding the two had symbolically become one. He did this as a joke at first, but found dresses to be far more comfortable than anything the other lords were wearing. The Peep couple took over the farm once Beau's parents passed on, and now I find myself travelling through it on my journey to bring my daughter back from the dead. Faith. I feel the crook wrap around my neck and drag me backwards. I feel the breath of someone behind me as I realise I've dropped my bare skin and mementos upon the ground. What do you think you're doing here, your old crone? Mary Peep talks softly into my ear. Forgive me, my lady. I was only passing through. I didn't realise then that the farm of the legendary little Bo Peep. Mary pulls me close to her, not buying it. She must be used to petty thieves breaking into her lap by now. 
I should throw you to the wolf in the woods for your lies. I laugh at her response. Didn't you know, my lady? The wolf is dead. Why? I knocked off his head myself when he took my daughter from me. Liar! Mary turns me round to face her, but my face remains scornful and sincere. She gasps and lets me loose. Did you really kill the wolf? I nod and she begins laughing hysterically. That's incredible! I can't quite believe it. But anyone who is brave enough to take down the wolf is welcome on our farm. I thank her, thank her as she offers me a nightcap in her barn. Before I sleep, she invites me in for tea, and I tell her and her husband about my quest. Impossible, Bo claims of disbelief. You can't return the dead to the land of the living. Mary seems hesitant, and I know she agrees with her husband's view. But she can also see how serious I am about my quest. The morning after our conversation, I go to leave, and Mary gives me a hug goodbye and offers me her legendary crook. I refuse at first, but she insists, since she has plenty of others, and I accept it gratefully. I tie my fur to the straight end of the crook and carry it over my shoulder, making my way into the village, in hopes someone there will point me in the direction I need to go.